I'm going to talk about our um, just a very uh, new project uh, called Europa STI, where we're investigating tethered and free space communication techniques for sending signals through the ice for a nice ocean probe at Europa. Um, so there was a study that was done um, about a Europa Tunnelbot mission concept um, by uh, NASA folks and um, some other folks um, at Hopkins and uh, Illinois and uh, Idaho National Laboratory. And um, the technical objective for this type of mission is to achieve um, ice penetration into the ocean on an ocean, ice ocean world, um, particularly uh, we're looking at Europa. And we needed to do this in about three years, um, reach a depth we um, considered 20 kilometers to be our uh, achievable depth there in about three years. Uh, and or um, if we determined that there was a water pocket within the ice shell at about a four kilometer, say, depth, um, that we could maybe determine had um, connection to the ocean, so it was being fed by the ocean, that might also be an objective, a place that we could um, achieve uh, our objectives, which for science um, are to look for signs of life. And so the science objectives uh, closely followed those of the Europa SDT report, um, where we would search for evidence of life at Europa. We would assess the habitability of Europa via these in situ techniques, which are uniquely available for this concept for the tunnel bot, and then characterize um, those um, properties also that were um, the um, environmental characteristics that would either support or um, maybe um, not so support our um, detections of biosignatures. So here um, is the structure of Europa, um, and as you can see, it's a very interesting um, uh, world. We have, uh, as Ty mentioned, that's th basically three layers at Europa. We have the, the um, thitter, uh, thick, um, potentially thick ice layer at the top, which is a brittle upper layer um, and a more ductile lower layer, and then the ocean beneath. Um, and we don't really fully understand yet um, what the structure is like, how thick is that brittle layer compared to the ductile layer, how thick is the overall ice shell, are there water pockets within the ice? Um, how briny um, are some of these layers? Um, and these are all challenges then for a potential uh, mission of this um, potential architecture of getting through the ice down to the ocean, sampling on our way, um, trying to understand this environment both therm thermally and mechanically um, as we design this type of mission to achieve our goals. Um, so the, our project is um, really focused on that um, portion behind the tunnel bot. So how do we transfer that information, that very important information, from this um, subsurface uh, probe to the landed portion that then sends our um, fantastic science data back to Earth? Um, and so um, a couple strategies have been um, thought about where we're con considering a communication tether. Um, and then also these repeaters um, where you may be using a free, t free space type of communication um, to where um, because of these uh, challenges within I uh, Europa's ice shell, the tether may not be the most robust to all of these challenges. And so um, if you had a repeater that could potentially um, jump across um, that break in your tether, um, you could uh, continue to send your information up to the land landed portion. And so some of these challenges, uh, we see evidence of this all over the surface Europa, many um, faults, um, evidence of um, you know, subsumption activity potentially, where you have convergent boundaries um, pos possibly put, um, pushing material beneath the surface, and then divergent boundaries, um, uh, strike slip type of boundaries, um, faults happening there. So can a tether you know, that is thin enough, right? Like we also have to consider mass for these missions. Is it thin enough to spool out for a whole 20 kilometers while still um, being somewhat robust to the potential activity within uh, Europa's ice shell? And um, you know, if so or if not, under what conditions um, are these viable options? Um, if the tether's not um, you know, doable in all the environments of Europa's ice shell, what other options do you have? Could you use free space communications to provide alternative um, techniques? Um, and so we're exploring this with our, um, our project. Um, we have folks from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute who have been doing um, sub um, ocean, uh, uh, within the ocean, sub ice, sub sea ice type of exploration where they have been using tethers for their submersibles for some years. Um, so we're starting out with these types of tethers that have been proven in these environments, um, which allow um, these submersibles to uh, move around sort of independent of where the ship is located. Um, it can move around and do exploration of the seafloor and find those um, really interesting hydrothermal vents that we know are happening there. And so we're starting with those tethers. Um, we have um, particularly picked out um, four types of tethers here um, that we will um, explore for their robustness, particularly to shear motion, as we expect there to be that to be happening um, at the faults. And um, we're going to explore um, some um, tethers that are more um, uh, armored for to be potentially robust and doing the comparison then for how heavy they are um, and how um, you know much that would uh, require for mass for a spaceflight. 
And we're also looking at uh, thinner um, uh, copper ribbons. Um, potentially, their low temperature ductility may prolong their survival in these environments. And they're also, um, they also have the potential that we can maybe um, heat them, um, and that would relieve some of the stress that may be acting upon them in the ice shell. And so how are we going to do this? Well, first, we, we want to think a lot about the ice that they're going to be in, inside of um, and, and, and really explore those parameters, um, thinking about grain size, porosity, and also potential impurities within the ice, both composi different compositions as well as brines, um, you know, different amounts of brines in these compositions, and incorporate those into the ice that we build so that we can really get a good understanding of how the ice mechanics um, changes with those um, changes in composition, thinking about um, where the ice grain boundaries and those, those impurities happen with, uh, between the grain boundaries. Um, and how that affects um, just the loads that are placed on the ice and then subsequently the tether, um, you know, how that affects um, the, the transfer of the loads to the tether and how it uh, just all behaves together. Um, and of course, we, we uh, picked out these uh, certain uh, impurities and, and uh, things from observations that have been done of Europa, um, finding both um, hydrosulfuric uh, acid, um, water frost, and hydrated salts, um, potentially from the ice, the ocean and rock interactions that's happening. Um, so here's the really cool uh, testing apparatus, pun intended, um, that they have at uh, Lamont Dowry Earth Observatory. So we're again pairing with um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute with their tethers. We're freezing their tethers into these ice blocks. And then this, this apparatus, this loading apparatus, can um, place the loads, the shearing loads that we want to explore on our tethers. And this is um, the testing. Um, uh, you know, our test setup is based on the um, concrete. So they do these same kind of tests for concrete where they have the, the rebars going through the concrete and they do these shearing tests to understand their, their mechanical strengths. So we're going to be doing very similar tests, um, exploring temperatures and then the velocities of these um, like potential strike slip, like fault shearing um, loads. And then um, as we move forward um, past this, um, so again, this is just um, some of the work we've only done very initially. Um, past this, we want to also then consider these other strategies for communications, just in the case of where the tethers may not be the mo most robust. Um, so these additional strategies will include um, uh, radio frequency and other free space communication techniques. And we're interested in um, these also to understand how they behave in the different regimes within the thermal mechanical layering in Europa. Um, would they potentially be most applicable in certain regimes in the ice shell, whereas the tether may be most applicable in other regimes? Trying to really understand that. Um, and we will further uh, explore this through modeling efforts just of the Europa's ice shell itself. We're going to take into account um, fault movements, do fracture mechanics modeling, um, consider tidal forcing and thermal mechanical characteristics of the ice shell, its viscosities. Um, and then also, um, one interesting thing that we've um, been thinking about is as so our, our cryobot, you know, melts its way. This is a concept that we have is melting its way. So your water is refreezing behind you sort of in this column. You know, is that refreezing ice going to be uh, similar to the surrounding ice that you've just passed through? Or is it going to refreeze in a different way, changing that compositional layering potentially? And how would that then affect your tether that's all within that column of ice behind you that's been refrozen, um, as well as the RF um, or, you know, uh, free space communication um, uh, repeaters that have been frozen in behind you as well? Um, so we're going to be doing further modeling to, to understand that, um, and that's going to be done by folks at um, John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, Southwest Research Institute, and we have a um, uh, University of Southern Maine, um, and we're going to be continuing just to explore those and try to understand where in Europa's ice shell can we, um, you know, have this strategy of communication, like where best is the tether going to be, um, you know, doing the best for us with a higher probably data rate transfer, but then when we need a repeater, you know, can it also be robust in certain um, regimes um, that we can depend on those. Um, so in summary, our project, the Europa STI project, is going to characterize the deployment capability and mechanical strength of these multiple tethers. Um, in the laboratory set, uh, uh, situation where we um, are simulating Europa-like conditions, um, we'll do a lot of modeling to understand the thermal mechanical environmental hazards that are possible within Europa's ice shell and uh, that could, pot um, could uh, be potential risks um, to our, our communication techniques. And then we'll evaluate the system performance of, of these free space um, uh, communication strategies to, to further um, our understanding of where we want to employ certain techniques, where we want to have, um, you know, our reliability um, on these as we, as we want to go down and explore Europa's, Europa's ocean. So I'd um, just like to thank everyone for their time, um, and thanks to all my colleagues um, as we push forward um, onward to Europa's ocean. So thank you. 
So we have time for a couple questions. It just occurred to me that there's an experiment in Antarctica called Ice Cube. They have 50 2.8 kilometer uh, setups. Have you talked to them and gotten lessons learned from? from so their um, my colleague Ralph Lorenz, he's kind of more the expert on this for you, but he definitely we've we've definitely are considering that um, and what they've done um, to 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 build upon their their knowledge that they've gained there. Yes, thank you. I just had a question about how. Um, the ice changes uh, like either the radio frequency or the acoustics for the repeater mechanism. Like if you have to consider the uh, geometry of the ice and how if it moves, how it'll change your signal, that kind of thing. Do you mean like one, if a fault happens? And yeah, if a fault happens or just from refreezing or, or whatever other mechanical changes. So I think this is these are the kinds of things that we'll be exploring. Like we, we understand that like with with depth, you know, Europa's ice shell is going to change with fracture, um, occur, you know, fracture uh, motion happening. Um, things are going to, and this is exactly what we want to explore um, to try to understand how robust are they to these this type of activity. How do, would it change our signal? Uh, oh, and the other thing I didn't mention is we really want to um, constrain the attenuation um, of the signal as it moves apart because you need to understand like how often you need to drop these these um, repeaters off behind you. You know, how far can your signal transfer across if you have a break in your tether in between? So, um, yeah, these are exactly what we're looking at. So. Yeah. 